Good morning. Today, we'll be talking about heart failure as the World Cardiology Day is just round the corner. Thank you, Dr. Tosin, for Dr. Majikodomi, for coming on the program. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Pamela. I'm delighted to be here again. Can you just um, explain what is heart failure and how common is it? Okay, so uh, heart failure is a clinical uh, condition whereby the heart is unable to supply enough blood to meet the body's metabolic demands. So as I'm sure everybody listening knows, the heart is a pump through which blood is circulated both to the lungs and to the body. The body has its metabolic demands both at rest and also when you're exercising or exerting yourself. And the body, is a, the heart is supposed, is supposed to pump out blood to be able to meet those demands in both clinical conditions, whether you're at rest or whether you're exerting yourself. The syndrome of heart failure occurs when for various reasons, the heart is not no longer strong enough to pump the blood out either to meet the body's demands and metabolic demands when you're exerting yourself or if sometimes even at rest. Now that's actually quite interesting because a lot of people think, you know, if you have your heart has failed, you've died. So what do you mean by failure? You know, is it, are you dying? Are you dead? You know, has your heart stopped? If your heart has failed, if you say anything has failed, you know? Um, so you're, what you're explaining is that it's something, it's sort of a decompensation. Can I, can I say that? Yes, you can. The, the, it's failing. Not, it hasn't failed completely. Failed completely. Excellent. Right. So there's a lot of discussion within the cardiology community regarding the firm that using the terminology heart failure is actually very unhelpful for exactly what you just described. That it's not really a really it's not a it's not really a good uh, description of the problem. But it's kind of one of those things that has stuck because we've been using this technology for decades. And so it's kind of remained. But you're quite right. Just because you have heart failure doesn't mean that you're dying or you're about to die or anything like that. It just simply means that where the heart is functioning normally, now it is not functioning at the normal um, level that is sufficient to be able to do exactly what the heart is supposed to do in terms of meeting the body's metabolic demands. So although we use the terminology heart failure, it's actually just more of an indication that the heart is not working at its optimum. And then there are various degrees uh, from the op away from the optimum that you can describe how the how well the heart is working may be very close to the optimum, or it can be very, very far away from the optimum. And so you can have mild heart failure, if you like, moderate heart failure or severe heart failure uh, where severe is obviously very far away from the uh from what we would term normal and mild is very close to what we would uh describe as normal with moderate being somewhere in between now would you say that um these are you've described the different types of heart failure or the different stages of heart failure I've described the different stages of heart failure and heart failure is a really it can be quite a complex clinical syndrome so it's usually it's very tempting to describe it at a particular moment in time but actually it is a syndrome that changes over time in some patients it's something that is stable for a while and gets better in some patients it's a syndrome that just gradually gets worse with time no matter what we as doctors or cardiologists are able to do uh, but i think one of the things we're trying to achieve today is to give a lot of hope to anybody who has been told they have heart failure to let them know that um, it is a clinical syndrome. It does sound very terrifying, but there's there's no reason to lose hope. There are a lot of things that can be done, a lot of interventions that we're able to perform to help people. And I think the patient we have today who is with us is going to be a very good example of the kinds of things that people can expect to achieve if they've been diagnosed with heart failure. That's great. We'll be talking to him later. But first, who, you know, what causes heart failure and who is at risk of getting it? Okay, so that's an excellent question. There are many causes of heart failure, very many causes. There's a long list, but the commonest cause, which is most applicable in the environment of Nigeria, is hypertension, high blood pressure or high BP, as some people may refer to it. That is the commonest cause of heart failure. Um, 
coronary artery disease blockages in the blood vessels that supply the muscle of the heart can also cause cause heart failure Really, the diagnosis can be made by any, any doctor, most usually a cardiologist. There are a number of investigations that the doctor will request. There are three baseline fundamental investigations that will be performed if you ever suspect a patient of having a heart failure. So one of them is a chest x-ray because the heart becomes swollen and you can see the heart being enlarged on a chest x-ray. One is an ECG to look at the rhythm of the heart to see if the rhythm of the heart is normal or abnormal, which may be an indication of a cause of heart failure or as a result of heart failure. Um, and also trying to be a clue as to the why, why, why the heart failure is occurring in the first place. And then the final most important um, investigation is an echocardiogram, which is basically an ultrasound of the heart. And it allows us to look at the heart chambers in great detail. It allows us to measure the efficiency, how well the heart is working compared to normal, whether it's just a little bit um, uh, abnormal, close to normal, or very far from normal, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. And it can give an indication as to the cause of the heart failure. Sometimes the cause of the heart failure may be the valves inside the heart don't function properly, they're leaking or they're very tight. And then in those situations, we know that the correct treatment there is to repair that valve, either by repairing it through surgery or replacing it through surgery. Um, if there are hints on the echocardiogram, there are blockages of the, of the blood vessels that supply the muscle of the heart, then the correct solution in that instance is to see whether uh, improving the blood supply either, either through surgery or through stents can also improve the patient's heart failure. And once the diagnosis is made, there are some blood tests that need to be, need to be done, such as checking the patient's kidney function, their full blood count, and also uh, performing a test called a BNP, uh, which is a, a marker in the blood that tells us about whether patients have heart failure or not. All these, when we put all this together, that allows us to now give the patients the correct treatment, whether it's just tablets, whether it is uh, doing procedures on them that can help to improve their symptoms, to make them feel better. But more importantly, uh, when patients have heart failure, their chances of living to the uh, expected age is greatly reduced. And this reduction or, or inability to achieve your expected longevity is related to the severity of heart failure. And one of the things that I'm very passionate about is taking the steps required to make sure that patients live as long as they need to live. So not just making them feel better, but also making them live longer. Um, those are the kind of things that we as cardiologists aim to do when we treat patients with heart failure. Can, I mean, with that very worrying statement, can heart failure be prevented? Yes. So in the, in the case of um, cause, reversible causes such as high blood pressure or blockages of the heart arteries in the form of coronary artery disease, those are things that can, be, that can be done to be prevented. So if you have high blood pressure, if your high blood pressure is treated aggressively and your blood pressure is now normal on medication, it is very unlikely that you will develop heart failure. If you have risk factors to, for developing blockages in the heart arteries, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, you're overweight, you have something called sleep apnea, if you have all of those things and you do all the necessary modifications to your lifestyle and to your diet to make sure that you your sugars are well controlled, your salt in your diet is reduced, the fat in your, in your diet is as low as possible, all of those things can reduce the risk of you developing heart failure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dean, for coming on the program and to share your experience with us. My pleasure. Can you tell us, um, how did you find out you had heart failure? What were the symptoms that you experienced? Well, thank you very much. It's possible I had this problem from childhood. I, I don't know. But growing up in the last 20 years, I know I was having some problems. You know, difficulty in breathing was part of it. And uh, climbing a stair, you know, stairs is a problem. And I noticed I was having palpitation, which has lasted in the last 20 years. But at my age now, I'm 47. So realizing that um, I'm no longer strong to do what I'm supposed to do, and uh, feeling sick, I had to go to hospital. It was actually 
a hospital I went to within my home that referred us to another hospital, then to Urakia Multispecialist Hospital. So it has been a long battle with me. I noticed I was not strong until I got to Urakia. It was then I understood that I was having a health problem. It was then it was I knew that look, you have a heart disease or a heart situation that can actually be dangerous to your life you know, to shorten your lifespan. So um, it was um, 2019, I first came to Iraq here and that opened my eyes greatly because I've also seen people that had similar cases, similar challenges, even in the office, but they don't know what it is. Today, I can stand better to tell them what it is because I've received some help. So basically the symptoms are the signs, the unnecessary fatigue, the weakness, you can't even stay, you know, climb stairs. You can't do what you're supposed to do as a young man. You know, you know that this situation is actually get out of hand. But most importantly, puppy so much. So the irregular heartbeat was, you know, beyond measure. But when I came to Iraq here, after running some tests and they, with their expertise, they were able to advise me that this is the situation I am. And I find myself, you know, till this day. And so, how do you feel now after you've had treatment? After you've had the diagnosis, after you've had treatment, are, are you much stronger now? Yes, I'm much stronger. Actually, I was on treatment, but something happened last year. I, I slumped, I fainted several times. You know, I lost consciousness. It was just like passing out. So, and I could remember, Dr. Maggie Kudmi has told me, this situation you are in is a very dangerous one, but let's manage it and you get better. I was actually strong. I went for a wedding. And in that place, I, I slumped, I passed out. And uh, when I came, um, the situation was clearly interpreted to me what it is because I had a heart blockage. So when there's no enough blood going to the brain, you know, it's like a disconnect. And that was what caused the slumping and uh, fainting. But eventually I was given some help. I had to go a undergo a procedure where I was given a CRTP, that is a pacemaker, which uh, since uh, April 12th, April 12th, 2001, and uh, with the right medication. That is why I'm looking the way I'm That's why you're out. smiling. <laughs> <laughs> I look very happy and I'm okay. And okay. I follow every instruction, try to maintain a healthy lifestyle. I don't drink after all. I don't smoke. I don't do before now. So the thing has helped me. And each time I have a, a, any issue, that I'm confused about, I quickly reach out to doctor and he will guide me. So I feel happier and I'm happy that I'm going to live longer. Uh, unlike when I was not saying fear that there was no hope, you know. So that's the situation now. You can see Thank my you. face. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to see your happiness. You know, I'm happy as well. And we thank, thank God you. The, the doctor was able to do it for you. Yes, so, Dr. Magical Me, thank you very much for putting that beautiful smile on Mr. Dean's face. <laughs> so can we just ask a bit more? He talked something, he said something about he thinks he may have had it since he was younger. He talked about heart block, he talked about palpitations. Could you explain a bit more? Absolutely. So, um, first of all, I really want to thank Dean for, for agreeing to do this. He's a busy guy, he's got lots of things to do, and to take out of his personal time to come and educate other people about heart failure uh, is something that is truly commendable. I really want to thank him for that. Now, I first came across Dean, uh, we met in May of actually 2018, um, and he, had, he was really uh, symptomatic at that time. He was very short of breath. Uh, he, his ankles were not particularly swollen, but he was very symptomatic. When, he, when we did his echocardiogram, we saw that his heart function was greatly diminished. So a normal heart would normally expect to work with, with an efficiency of between 55 to 65%. His was working at about 20%. So that's really, really severely impaired. So we did a number of tests. We checked him for any heart blockages that may, that may have caused his heart to go weak and he did not have any heart blockages. And he's quite correct in um, I had warned him that people who have very weak hearts are very prone to uh, sudden death, where they just slump and and and, and fall over. So we, we monitored his excuse me, we monitored his heart at that time in 2018, and he did not have anything suggestive of a high risk for sudden death. And that's the, one of the reasons why I mentioned before that as cardiologists, one of our jobs is to take the to take the right steps to make people live 
longer. And one of the ways we can do that is to reduce the risk of sudden death. So what we and once we had investigated him at that time, we put him on a number of medications. And there are some foundational medications that we put people on that will help them to feel better and also help them live longer. Um, there are four classes of drugs. There are, ACE, there are now um, what we call RNAs or um, neprolysin inhibitors. There's beta blockers. There's aldotensin receptor antagonists. And there's SGL2 uh, inhibitors. All these drugs are available in Nigeria, widely available. You know, there, there are no restrictions on them. And any patient with heart failure needs to be on at least those four medications. And we started Dean on those medications. In fact, the SGL2 inhibitors were not available at that time. It, these are very new drugs where the evidence came up over the last two years. And obviously we have followed the evidence and we've now put him on those medications. And he had actually been doing very well in 2019 while we were continuing to follow him up because Dean has been excellent at complying with coming to his regular clinic visits. We noticed that he had developed a clot in his heart. And so we put him on blood thinning medication for six months to dissolve the clot away to reduce his risk of having a stroke. And once the clot had disappeared and with getting his medical therapy correct with the appropriate monitoring, his heart function actually improved so we could stop the blood thinning medication and he's not had any problems with the blood clot inside the heart since then. He then referenced uh, the episode he had in April of last year where he suddenly collapsed while he was at a wedding. He obviously did the right thing because he's a, you know, he's a very compliant patient. He, he reached out to me immediately, I think it was on a weekend, and he immediately came into the hospital and we found that he was in heart block. Now, given the fact that he had this uh, cardiomyopathy, what we call a dilated cardiomyopathy, and he had heart block, his ECG had always shown that he had what we call a broad QRS, uh, which meant that one part of the heart was being activated before the other. I don't want to get too technical, but it meant that he was suitable for this CRT device. And so we inserted that for him. This is, a, this is a device that has three wires, all of which sit inside the heart and help the heart coordinate its, its contraction better to improve its, its, it, the function, but also reduce the risk of um, the problems that he was having with heart block, where he was uh, slumping and, and, and fainting, was actually at risk of dying suddenly. And he was very lucky and blessed that that did not occur. And we did that for him without any issues. And since then, he's been doing very well. You can see the smile today as he's smiling. Um, he's very happy. His wife is equally happy. Uh, she comes to clinic with him and is really delighted at how he's doing. And honestly, if he did not tell you that he had heart failure, you would never know. He feels completely well. He has no symptoms. He's working. He's economically productive, and doing everything that he would need to do um, um, as 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 a gentleman of his age. And it's really really um, welcoming to have him here to give his own testimony, so that other people in this situation can know that you know there are things that can be done. Just because you have a diagnosis doesn't mean that your life needs to be limited or shortened or that the quality of your life needs to be needs to be diminished or that the longevity that you should look forward to should be any way impaired. We have all the necessary tools here in Nigeria. You don't need to travel abroad to be able to make the diagnosis, manage these patients, deal with any complications that come about um, without, without anything. And Dean is a very good example of that. Yes, no, I, I, I mean, I'm very happy to see him and, and, and see how he is. And I think also, I think what is important is not just um, the fact that they are, you know, you're able to, to treat him, but because a lot of people are still, you know, they stay in, they keep these symptoms until it become very bad. And the word you used, which I loved that you said about him, was compliant. People then come in, they have a treatment, and then for reasons best known to themselves, they stop taking their medication, they revert. But you said he is compliant, and that's why he has continued to get better and better. Because that's what you're telling me. The story is, that, look, he came in bad, he got better, he got, had some setbacks, but actually now he's even better than he was before. So it's Absolutely. actually a, a fantastic story and really um, want, to, want to really take, take away or something to take away is the fact that people really need to be compliant with their treatment. And if they have a problem, go back to their doctor. Correct. Because we also have that as a second issue that a lot of people, when they have a problem, 
They say, ah, that doctor is not good anymore. Let me go somewhere else. Actually, the doctor you were seeing may be the best person to, to take you to the next stage, particularly if it's a specialist diagnosis. So I think these are some of the things that I've taken away from what Mr. Dean has, has told me, to you know, told us today. And I think that we all need to take to heart. So another question I'd like to ask, are there any steps, for example, because there may be people out there living with heart failure, and are there sort of any steps that they need to take general steps that would help them yes there are there are things that they can do um and a lot of them boil down to a lot of the general medical advice that we give most people so it is stay active try and exercise try not to put on too much weight um monitor your salt intake because salt intake leads to fluid retention fluid retention can put more strain on the heart in terms of all the fluid in your lungs fluid in your legs so reducing your salt intake is very important, your, your, your fat intake so you don't gain weight, your sugar intake so you don't develop diabetes, and, me, and as you said quite correctly, being compliant with your drugs, making sure you take your drugs religiously, you don't miss doses, you don't let your, your prescription run out before you refill them. And really, I, I love the point that you made, and Dean, again, is an excellent example of it. He's so compliant. He comes to clinic whenever uh, clinic is uh, he's required to come up for clinic for reviews. If he feels anything at all, he turns up and gets checked out, make sure that there are no issues. And that is why he looks as well as he looks today. And I think he's an example to anybody listening who either has heart failure or knows someone who has heart failure. Please, please be compliant with taking your medications religiously. Don't miss doses. Don't let your prescriptions run out. And make sure you go and see your doctor regularly. Dean is a, is a busy guy. I don't ask him to come to the clinic every month. You know, we'll probably see each other every three to six months, something like that, which is two or three times a year. Uh, for someone with heart failure with uh, on complex medication, having a complex heart device, I don't think that is too much in terms of disrupting their lifestyle. Obviously, as doctors, our aim is not to disrupt patients' lifestyle, it's to keep them well so that they can do whatever it is that they need to do it's not we don't want them to be coming to clinic every day that's that's not a good that's not a success story from our point of view so make sure you come as often as your doctor needs you to come check you out and that is how you can stay as well as dean is doing okay so dean would you have any words of advice for people who are listening to you today um for people that are listening to us today i have to say that once you see symptoms or what you see or what you call unusual signs in your body. Um, try to assess medical help. Go to a hospital that, um, uh, that a good hospital where a problem can be diagnosed. I didn't know Iraqi multi-specialist hospital, but when I was introduced to them, I realized, look, this is the place. People look at the name and the size of the hospital and begin to nurse fears that the money will be too much, but obviously you cannot compare your life with the money you are going to spend to buy drugs and take care of your health. So anybody out there that is having any of these symptoms like palpitation, you know, shortness of breath and having difficulty climbing stairs or carrying things or having palpitation, the best thing is quickly rush to the hospital, let them examine you, and then you start the procedure or the process of medication. In, in 2018, when I started this, Yes, you may say it's a long journey, but three years after that, I had a crisis where I slumped. Just because I have been on medication, that was why it was even a, a mild case. Well, today I'm, I'm healthy and alive. I can do everything. I can go to my work. I do, I'm busy. I do uh, everything I'm supposed to do. But most importantly is that I have to the doctor's instruction at all times. And whenever I have appointment, I try to do. So everyone should take it serious because these days, this is the major cause of death, especially in Nigeria. If I look at what has happened in my office, two people died in their sleep. Somebody slumped the other day. And you can see this is just within my immediate environment. So if it's happening like this and people are dying and people are packing up because of situations that could have been managed, I think it's something dangerous. So we should assess medical help on time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I would just like to say very briefly that um, 
just to really reiterate what Dean has said, anybody who has these kinds of symptoms needs to come to go to a hospital, see a cardiologist, get assessed. The foundational, uh, the foundational investigations are a chest X-ray, an ECG, and an echocardiogram uh, to make the diagnosis. There's foundational medication that everybody should be on up titrated to the maximum tolerated doses and regular follow-ups are mandatory. And you also have to be on the lookout for complications because they can occur just like they did in Dean's case, but rapid assessment and right, timely intervention can keep people well and alive for a very long period of time. Does consuming too much salt cause heart failure? Not directly, but it can if you develop high blood pressure because of um, you know, high consumption of salt, and then because of the untreated high blood pressure, that can lead to um, heart failure. I should actually mention, I hope we get this in, is that um, excessive alcohol intake can also cause heart failure. There's a form of heart failure called alcoholic cardiomyopathy. And I actually have a number of patients that I treat whose heart failure was caused due to excessive intake of alcohol. So if you drink a glass of wine every so often, you are not at risk, calm down. But if you are somebody that drinks a bottle or three or four bottles of beer a day, that is where you can have run into a problem of the alcoholic cardiomyopathy. So that's just something to be aware of that we should state. Now, we talked about preventing um, heart failure. How do we prevent it in a person who has hypertension specifically? Because hypertension is something that's very common in our environment. Extreme. And so a person, yes. Yeah, so how does a person who has hypertension, specifically that condition, prevent themselves from getting heart failure? Excellent question. And I think the most important thing is they must take their tablets. They must make sure that their blood pressure is consistently below 130 over 80. You and I have done shows before when we've talked about know your numbers and be aware of the fact that, you know, and the number that they need, hypertensive patients need to be aware of is that 130 over 80. Their blood pressure needs to be consistently below those two uh, landmarks. If they do that consistently, they will reduce their risk of developing heart failure. Uh, the patients who have high blood pressure, who develop heart failure are those whose blood pressures are consistently 160, 170, 180, and they're not taking their treatment or they're not taking their drugs consistently, those are the patients that will develop heart failure. And the best way they can reduce their risk is just to take their medications and make sure they check their blood pressure regularly, see their doctor regularly to, to monitor them for complications and make sure that they're doing well. In a number of cases, you know, people say, oh, mama's legs are swollen, but that's old age and then they just leave it. How seriously should we take these swollen legs, particularly in the elderly? You should always take them very seriously, especially in the elderly. Um, they should never be written off as normal unless they have been seen and assessed and investigated for why their legs are swollen. Because in the elderly, people can develop heart failure without any dramatic uh, symptoms. Because again, what people will say is, oh, my mommy is tired going up the stairs. Oh, it's just her age. Oh, her legs are swollen. Oh, it's just her age. Actually, it could be that she's developing heart failure. And by doing something about it, you can actually make people much better. Funny enough, I saw somebody yesterday in the clinic, a 77-year-old man who has developed a bit of leg swelling and breathing difficulties over the last two weeks. He's 77 and he needs to be treated for heart failure. And I just started him on heart failure treatment and he needs a number of procedures to sort of work out exactly what's going on with him. Um, and I know that a lot of people will say, oh, just somebody 70 or 75 or even 80, they'll say, oh, they're too old. Uh, nothing can be done. It's not true. It doesn't matter how old they are. We can always try and do something simple to help them. We don't always have to do something very invasive or do a big operation, uh, but we can usually do something to help them out. So please, if you notice these things in, a, in your mother or grandmother, swollen legs, she's getting tired easily, don't hesitate to bring her or him around to the hospital and get them get, let them get investigated and make sure it's not due to heart failure. Thank you very much.